Hi, it's Robin with the patron exclusive video for April 2020, continuing on with my book series. Today we're going to be looking at programming the Commodore 64 The Definitive Guide by Rato Colin West, the Encyclopedic Reference Guide to the Commodore 64 Computer, published by Compute. Take a look at the back cover. The Commodore 64 is an amazing computer. Its price makes it available to the average family. Its power and flexibility allow it to perform sophisticated tasks from word processing to business calculations, and its sound and graphics capabilities make it the perfect fast action arcade game machine. Until now, complete information and advice on getting the most out of the 64 have been hard to come by. Programming the Commodore 64 The Definitive Guide by noted Commodore authority Rato Colin West provides that information. It's the encyclopedic reference guide to the Commodore 64. In the tradition of the renowned programming the PET CBM and programming the VIC, West presents 17 chapters of dictionaries, maps, basic and machine language examples, and programming aids. Unlike so many books, which are read only once, then discarded, programming the Commodore 64 remains an invaluable guide to your learning. You can lose yourself in this book for weeks. And this is totally true. <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, programming the PET CBM, the reference encyclopedia for Commodore PET and CBM users, and this is by Rachel Colin West. Yeah, this is an amazing book, and if you're interested in pet programming, absolutely check out this book. The book, described by Jim Butterfield as unquestionably the most comprehensive and accurate reference I have seen to date. So... Maybe I'll get into that book sometime, but yeah, so this is the same guy, and he writes excellent books. And about You Can Lose Yourself in this book for weeks, I've actually been reading this all month, and I got kind of sidetracked, but there is just so much in here. And you know, I, I did that video about adding hex support to BASIC. That was inspired by this book, or based on a small little program. And that was just like basically one page out of this book. It starts with BASIC and probes more deeply with each chapter. Ready to type in program? Show you how to use BASIC and kernel ROMs, the 6502-6510 microprocessor, the CIA, VIC, and SID chips, and the hidden RAM beneath the ROM in the 64. And major peripherals, tape and disk drives, printers, plotters, and modems are discussed as well. You'll discover many amazing things you can do with your 64. Here's a sample of what you'll find. Dozens of programming techniques and tricks to experiment with, a detailed dictionary of every Commodore 64 BASIC keyword, a dictionary of extensions to BASIC, including program examples, complete chapters on sound and graphics, an annotated list of the 6502-6510 machine language instruction set, a thorough map of the 64's ROM listed side by side with major VIC ROM differences, VIC-20 ROM differences, Numerous appendices, including advice on translating programs between the 64 VIC and PET CBM machines. Programming the Commerce 64 helps you improve your programming by giving you the technical information and advice you need. It answers the questions other reference guides leave unanswered. And as with all compute books, the appendices are packed with useful quick reference information and programming aids, including the automatic proofreader and Supermon. No matter what your programming level, Programming the Commerce 64 is one of the most valuable books on the 64 you could own. And I agree with almost all that. A little bit of it is hyperbole, but hey, it's marketing, right? In previous episodes of this book club, I've dealt with, of course, the amazing Commerce 64 Programmer's Reference Guide, which was published very early in the C64's life says here that's copyright 1982. And then mapping the Commodore 64, which the first, this is the second edition, but the first edition was published in 1984. And for the longest time, I think I mentioned before how the C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, this was the first book I got. This is an excellent book and easy to find still. At least I think it is easy to find. And for the time, an extremely good reference overall. And it wasn't until quite a bit later that I got myself mapping the Commodore 64 
I think we're into the late 90s by the time I got this mapping the Commerce 64, and it opened my eyes, as I mentioned in that episode, to a bunch of things. Now, for whatever reason, I did not get a copy of West's book here until the 2000s. I got it at, I don't remember for sure, but I think I got it at one of the computer shows down in Chicago and found out that this really was a good book. And so I, I looked at it and I thought, oh yeah, well, I bought it for sure. I buy almost every Commodore book I find. But it was only fairly recently that I started really digging into this book. It was probably when I started this channel, so like in 2018, that I finally got really reading this book. And I now think that maybe this is the best book that was ever published about programming the Commerce 64. Better than mapping better than the C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, but strangely, it's not very well known compared to the other two books. So one thing, one reason I think that might be, is that this book was not published until March of 1985. I don't know exactly when in 84 mapping was published, but by 85, perhaps, a lot of people thought that they already had the books they needed, course by 85 the Amiga was coming out and some people were starting to move to that. I think there was a rapid drop off. Of course the Commodore 64 continued to be very popular and sold very well for years after 85 but perhaps most of the people who were going to buy books about how to program the C64 had already bought those previous two books mapping and the programmer's reference guide or I don't know. Anyway, it just seems to me that this is a very rare, for how, for how great this book is, it's not very well known. Bit of a mystery, but I think maybe it was published a little late just because it was such a, it was, it's so epic, it's so huge, that it took West two, three, like three years to write. I don't know, I'm, I'm only guessing at that, but anyway, so I highly recommend that you get this book. Okay, so let's just, let's take a look through table contents and then I'll just give you some highlights on this book. This is a book you could read every day for like a month and be learning so much new every month and then have to come back to it again. Just an introduction about the book, getting to know the 64, and it shows the various connectors, the keyboard, and how to edit in BASIC. Then there's a thorough BASIC reference guide which shows the syntax, all the keywords, and all the error messages. Then another section on BASIC, effective programming in BASIC. Okay, how to become fluent in BASIC, program systems and people, program design, system design, serious and less serious programming, debugging BASIC, and making BASIC run faster. Next, Commerce 64 architecture, introductory hardware topics, the 64's memory configurations, very good information about location 1 and 0, Commerce 64 ports, programming the CIAs, the complex interface adapters, those are the chips that like have timers in them and communicate with the keyboard, the joysticks, and so on. Program recovery and resetting, commercial software and hardware. Advanced BASIC. How BASIC is stored in memory, special locations and features of BASIC, dictionary of extensions to BASIC. Anybody who's interested in the programming videos I make will find this an incredible reference. Seven, I could probably just make a video about like every single thing in here and have like years of <laughs> years of videos to make, uh, just parroting what's in his book. <laughs> I try not to do that. Like uh, I try to come up with my own ideas that I'm interested in. But anyway, okay. And then finally, moving on from basic, chapter seven, sixty-five ten machine language, an introduction to the programming, a description of the sixty-five ten chip the 6510 machine language techniques and monitors for the 64. Monitor command dictionary assemblers for the 64. Machine language methods specific to the 64. Kernel routines, basic ROM routines, using RAM under ROM, modifying basic vectors interrupts. Chapter nine, mixing basic with machine language. RAM available for machine language routines, combining basic and machine language, relocating machine language. 10, vocabulary of the 6510 chip, the instruction set. Okay, and then in-depth chapters about the 64 ROM guide, a good memory map, graphics, sound, tape storage, disk storage, the control ports, 
major peripherals and a section on printers, plotters, modems, the RS-232 interface and the serial port, and then finally a bunch of appendices about, well, all sorts of things. How to type in the programs, proofreaders, and so on. So you see in total, and then an index at the end, the index starts on page 603. And just to give you an overview, <laughs> look how dense every single page is. Well, I mean, there's these little dividers, but... So around 600 pages like this. And a quick tour of each page about this book. Introduction. The two main objectives of this book are to teach competent programming on the Commodore 64 and to provide a comprehensive reference book for people wanting quick, accurate answers to questions about the 64. These two goals are difficult enough to achieve. For example, while virtually everyone begins with BASIC and progresses to machine language, it is often desirable to use both machine language and BASIC in examples, which means comparative newcomers to the 64 find themselves skipping sections of temporarily difficult text. It is practically impossible to arrange the material so that everything falls into a natural sequence for all readers, because many of the chapter headings themselves can't be understood properly without some knowledge of the machine's structure. So he takes the approach that he's going to start with basic, and then machine language, from simple to complex, and then mixing them together. And so the text contains two types of programs. First, there are very short routines intended to be typed in quickly and therefore with little chance of error. Second, there are longer, more practical programs which use graphics, sound, tape discs, and all the other features of the 64. Getting to know the 64, the 64's connectors, despite being written and published in the US, does a pretty good job of being international and taking in, like for example, he points out that the NTSC machines have a channel selector switch to choose between three or four, although he only says in the US. I would have appreciated a mention of Canada there too. <laughs> Commerce 64s for PAL type TVs in Europe and elsewhere don't have the switch. Hmm. Anyway, and uh, goes through the keyboard, basic terms. So some chapters are quite short and some are extremely long, like chapter three. Basic reference guide. This is a big one. Basic syntax. I love this. Basic is now the most popular language for personal computers. It's easy to write, test, and edit basic, and simple programs can be written by people with very little computing experience, which is exciting and encouraging. Basic is sometimes described as being like English, but the resemblance is tenuous. That reminds me of the claims of COBOL that I briefly examined in that recent video. There's excellent information for the beginning basic programmer here. A lot of this, of course, is covered in the programmer's reference guide and well, but this is another take on it. Then there's this basic keyword dictionary. It goes through every basic keyword, but there's extra information here that is in the programmer's reference guide. For example, the token, which is the hex, well, the numeric representation of each keyword is listed here, the abbreviated entry, and for example, informing that both direct and program modes, direct mode being when you're at the command prompt or at the ready prompt and you type in an instruction like new or load, and program modes where you put a line number first and then the instruction is executed later when you type run. So it just makes it clear what modes are available. And also this type clarifying, this is like a numeric function, of course, we don't have to look at all these, but just to get an idea, the AND as a logical operator, I find the examples here superior to most of those in the programmer's reference guide. For example, the ASCII function points out that you need to add CHR character string zero into any parameter for the ASCII function, which returns the numerical value of it, if there's a chance of a null string going in. If you don't, your program will actually stop with an illegal quantity error. Well, that's pretty annoying. So anyway, that's a nice little fix there. And he even tries to explain, well, not just tries, he, I think he succeeds pretty well, 
Like for example, this is the arc tangent, and he actually explains <laughs> uh, how it uses radians and the range and so on. Again, better than the programmer's reference guide. Now this book is huge. We're not going to go through every instruction, but, but you can just see how much depth there is here for every one of the keywords. Yeah, and I want to show this one too. Tab is special. In an older episode, I had I previously thought that tab was actually a string function. That is, that when you typed tab or actually just back a few pages here, space, tab and space are nearly the same. Space actually includes the bracket as part of its token. That is, if you have this token, that opening bracket is included in it, while all the other functions for the tab and space function, they're, they do not return a string of spaces. They only work in print and print number statements. Yeah, and it, it points out here that these it doesn't actually print spaces. It's actually printing cursor rights. <laughs> Again, the excellent detail in this book. That's just one I want to point out there. And the basic error message dictionary. That one of the very first videos I ever made was about all the basic errors. Actually, I don't even think I was... I thought to refer to this book while I was making it, but... I noticed that this one does not have that bad data error, which the programmer's reference guide incorrectly says. That bad data error goes way back to the very earliest pet ROMs, and even later pets did not have a bad data error. And here's another quirk that's explained, that when you type new, you may get a syntax error. And the reason for that is because the first byte of basic needs to be a zero. And if something has overwritten that, then if you poke a zero into that first byte of basic memory space, then the new will execute. So that just shows the level of detail that he went to when writing this book. All those quirks, all those discoveries that he probably had to make rather painfully over, I assume, a couple years of research, he put all that information in here and didn't skim over. Okay, now, Effective Programming in BASIC, Chapter 4. High-level advice on how to become fluent in BASIC, who the users are for your potential programs. Hey, you can see he writes like a, an essay just on that subject. So, flowcharts. And I love how so many of these early books are just all gung-ho on flowcharts. But he points it out right here. However, they are hard to modify and they take up space, so many people prefer to make outlines and notes, stylized lines of English resembling programs. There's no correct notation, and the sad fact is that any complex program remains complex in whatever way it is written down. So I totally agree with that. In those early days, there's just seemed to every book pushed flowcharting, and yet if it was simple enough to just express in a flowchart like this, once you're even a halfway decent programmer, it's just simple enough to just write the thing and not flowchart. And if it's more complicated, as he says, it's still going to be complicated. Flowchart or not, maybe at a very high level, flowcharting is useful when we're trying to show how different aspects of the system work, but it, it won't capture the, the detail necessary to actually program it. So he actually really gets into a lot of detail about the system designs, making your file structures, about using menus, debugging tips, and has good working examples here of many things, rounding, so on again. You can't spend forever on any any one section. Some excellent hints here on how to make BASIC run faster. So, <laughs> everything from turning off the video chip, reducing the interrupt rate, that actually makes the cursor flash slower as well. <laughs> Dimensioning your variables in order of importance, or in order of use, is another way of saying that. Being careful with how you use strings, 
to avoid garbage collection, crunching, that is, removing all the spaces in the program. That's my bad habit that I try to break when I'm attempting to explain things for my channel, and so on. Chapter 5, Commodore 64 Architecture. So it starts off with a description of binary and hexadecimal, a nice high-level description of how hardware works, how addressing works. It's not very complicated, and he describes it very well. And a bunch of these words like tables, buffers, pointers, vectors, good definitions of them here. This is a little program that you might want to try typing in that will display 255. I'm not sure why not 256, but anyway, it will show a section of memory real time. So it's an interrupt running. It will continuously copy memory onto the screen. And it's most interesting if you look at zero page, for example, or the stack. So zero page, the stack at page one, page two and three. Quite interesting to see it working in real time. And then you could be on the other, on the bottom half of the screen, typing in some instructions and seeing what is going on inside the C64. It's a lot of fun. Some information about TVs and monitors. Have you ever been confused about how the various memory configurations of the C64 work? Here, page 114. This is a good read. And it shows diagrams here of the three bits available in location one, where you can switch memory in or out, the ROMs and so on. And also these hardware lines that are only available from the cartridge port that your cartridge has to control. I didn't understand that at first, but cartridges like the Super Snapshot modify these and the Super CPU and so on to have more control over how the C64 is operating. And it shows a diagram here of what is switched in. Commerce 64 does have 64K of RAM, but by default, the basic ROM is at A1000. The kernel ROM is at E1000. Input-output, that is the VIC, the SID, and so on, are at D1000, and RAM in this one slot, C1000. So that's the default configuration there. And then the different layers, like at D1000, you can actually have the I.O. chips or the character ROM, or you can have RAM. So this is worth a study here. Well, it's at page 115. My friend Greg, who is writing C64 OS, on his website, he's written up his own take on this, and it's a really good read as well, so I recommend that. And so more things here about when a cartridge is plugged in, and so on. An excellent write-up about the C64 ports, the difference between the Commerce 64s that have 5-pin audio video out, and some have 8. I was working on a video on that, and it got stalled out. I had some trouble with that, but I wanted to show the difference between the 5-pin and the 8-pin C64s. Programming the CIAs. There's a memory map of the CIA chip. And I think that's original, and I, really, I actually like this layout better than the ones I've seen in other books. The CIA chips are the input-output chips that read the joysticks, read the keyboard, the user port, like if you have a modem plugged into it, and the timers that cause the regular system interrupt that scans the keyboard, flashes the cursor, and so on. That's all under the control of this chip, or these two chips. There's two identical chips located at DC00 and DD00 in C64 memory. And good programming instructions on how to use it section here about program recovery and resetting and if your computer has crashed due to your code starting with try the stop key first then try stop restore oh and let's talk about this crash i want to make a video about that too early c64s including the first one i owned will sometimes crash when you're typing in uh, just when you try to type in basic <laughs> it involves typing on the last line yeah, I want to make a video about that, how reset works, how the auto start works. Okay, moving on. It's been forever here. Chapter 6, Advanced Basic, 
How BASIC is stored in memory, special locations and features, and dictionary of extensions to BASIC. So much of what I've done with my channel has been this kind of information. I have to admit, I don't always go to this book for the information. The first time I specifically referenced this book for one of my episodes was that recent hex conversion one I did. But really, there's so many ideas here. <laughs> this is how BASIC is stored in memory. And here you can see, like, you know, color RAM is always fixed at that location, but where your basic RAM starts, screen memory. And many of these things are configurable. Uh, color RAM is fixed, unfortunately, but everything else can be configured. How basic is linked. I've gotten into this a little bit, but I really want to do a full episode about that. When you type a basic program in, it's stored in memory, and there is always that zero memory. We talked about that with that new instruction earlier. But then there are links in memory to the next line, and there's also a basic line number that's stored. So there's four bytes, two to link to the next line of basic, and two that are just a line number, which doesn't have anything to do with the location in memory, just a relative line number and then the actual basic text, which is encoded. And we got into that a bit in a couple episodes where each keyword, as shown earlier in this book, each keyword gets its own token, which is a single byte, but then things like constant numbers. So like when you type in 10 poke, the line number is a representation of 10 in hex. Poke gets turned into a single token. And then if you type poke 53280, then that's actually stored in plain ASCII text. So that takes up five bytes, typing in that 53280, comma zero, that's another two bytes. And then you hit return, well, you get an end of line zero. If that's the end of the program, then the link is set to the next line. And then there's actually two more zeros at the end. If the link is zero, zero, then that means it's the end of the program. So that's pretty fascinating. And it gets into a good explanation. For example, here's a little program that says print hello and so on. And then he writes a little program that scans that first line and shows the decimal representation of it in memory. Oh, and here's all those codes all together. And here's how variables are stored. And those are the four types, floating point, integer, string, or function definitions. That's stored as its own type of variable. And then the variable name is stored, just two letters maximum. You can type more in, but they're ignored. So the two letters of the variable, or either just one letter and a zero, those are stored here. And there's no separate flag for the different variable types. Instead, it's encoded into the name where the high bit, that is a value of 128, is added. So an integer has both variable names. The high bit is set, while floating point does not. The high bit is clear. And for a string, only the second byte is set, and a function definition, just the first. And then the five bytes after that store the information needed. So for a floating point, there's we were just talking about this last episode, one byte for the exponent, and then four bytes for the mantissa. Integers only use the two bytes, and then three zeros. And of course, they're turned back into floating points whenever you actually use them. String variables only require three of the bytes, and two are wasted. And then the function definition uses all five points to the definition of the function, points to the variable that's used in the function. That's something I could study more. How arrays are stored. An interesting section here about how to disable run, stop, and restore. And he gives four different methods of blocking it. How run, stop works. The stop key is not an interrupt-like device as it may appear to be. In fact, every 1 60th of a second, the kernel routine which tests the run, stop key is called. That routine looks at these locations and so on. So there's actually a machine language call that you could do if you want to check the stop key yourself in your program. How to program the function keys. It's interesting, he points out Commodore keyboards are very reliable. I didn't realize how true this is. Like I have a fair collection of Commodore 64s, 128s, and so on. And then 
or I do have computers from other manufacturers in my collection. And overall, those Commodore keyboards just keep on working and they don't require all that much maintenance with the big exception of the SX64, the portable Commodore 64. My keyboard is horrible on that and it totally needs some service, but they used a different method to make that light portable keyboard, but it really has suffered. Other manufacturers also used membranes and so on that, that uh, like a Spectrum keyboard, those absolutely have to be refurbished and redone. They just, they fall apart, some of them, and some other brands too. Now, of course, he was writing this when these keyboards were only a few years old. <laughs> Here we are, 35 years in the future, <laughs> reading this. But he's right. Okay, and here's a section about reading the keyboard, decoding the keyboard. This is by reading DC-100 and DC-01. I got into this with mapping. That This is something that mapping the C64 really opened up to me. And then also this bit about the keyboard scanning. I don't think that's explained at all in the program's reference guide. I think I could play about that in the mapping episode too. So it's nice to see it laid out. Okay, more and more stuff about reading the keyboard. Here's a bunch of zero page locations that have to do with the screen and the ROM routines. Nice collection of them there. And there's some interesting, if you're the kind of person who likes just playing around, peeks and pokes, there's some good ones in here. Okay, about appending basic programs, showing how you can take basic program one and two and add them together. An auto line number, how to block, save, and load. And this is very useful if you're like making, if you're playing around with basic and making, uh, you have some sprite or graphic data, or well, any kind of data, any kind of binary data. This is what you need right here, page 169. And you want to be able to load or save a block of data that isn't your basic code. That's what you need. Chain programs together. A computed go sub or computed go to. Normally you can't go to or go sub a computed line number because the go to command does not look for an evaluated number. It just looks for a literal, like a constant line number. But here's a very short patch program that copies basic from ROM into RAM. Uh, we did that in another episode once before. But anyway, this one patches basic so that instead it looks up, it does an evaluation on the go to amount. This term, deek, <laughs> a double byte peak. So it just shows how to simulate that or actually to make a function that does that. And here's how to do a doke. You can't do a function to do that because C64 basic functions only allow numerical formulas to be run. You can't actually do any instructions like a poke. Screen dump. Modifying list. This one's really cool. <laughs> it changes list so that instead of just printing out the ASCII, the Petsky characters for, you know, like a screen clear we're used to seeing that heart if you've done a reverse heart instead it'll print out the function in text just like this with the square brackets around it so anyway it's it's pretty cool here's mod this is probably one of the functions i most wish was built in to c64 basic but at least here's a little function de definition we can do pop values off the stack Extending print so that you can move the cursor to a certain location. I could spend forever in this chapter. Searching, sorting, tracing, blocking list, unlist as it's called. Gives this complicated procedure about how to do it. Var pointer finds the location of any variable stored in RAM. There. Ooh. So we're done basic, but you can see how deep he went to basic. We're up to page 200, and almost all that was focused just on basic. Oh, 
Okay, this book is so huge that I'm going to call it there for today. And in a future video, I'm going to get deep into the machine language section of this book. But in the meantime, get a copy of this book if you can find it anywhere. And it is available on archive.org. So you can just download it there. I'll put a link in the description below. And I highly recommend you dig into this book. There is so much here. It's amazing. And that's, that's kind of the point of these videos is just to let you know, like, I'm never going to be able to pack all this information into video. Well, I don't know if I made them for years, I guess I could just to make you guys aware that there is so much information out there. And these books are on archive.org and probably other places online. So you can get them for free if you can't find a real copy of it. And there's just so much to learn here. Thanks to each one of you for your support of this channel. But I'm really enjoying reading these books, going through them, getting excited for ideas. That's exactly what that last uh, hex decimal video was about. So give them a look and see what you think. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. And we'll talk to you next time.